Hello there. My name is uh, Erica Paulson. I'm from uh, Duke University, and I'd like to uh, give a talk on selected aspects of bowel obstruction, but really focus on when uh, do I worry uh, when I encounter patients with a suspected bowel obstruction. Many of the uh, comments I'm going to make have been nicely captured in this review article uh, published a couple of years ago uh, in Radiology, where I'm the first author and Dr. Thompson is also a an author. There is a surgical adage uh, that says, never let the sun rise or set on a small bowel obstruction. However, that's not really uh, the way we practice medicine anymore. Uh, small bowel obstructions are common. They account for about 20% uh, of admissions for the acute abdomen. However, most patients are, are, are treated conservatively with nasogastric tube decompression and resolve without surgery. Yet, there is this statistic that's true. A subset, maybe 5% of patients, can have substantial morbidity or mortality with small bowel obstruction if they develop strangulation or ischemia. And unfortunately, a clinical exam tests uh, and laboratory tests are not particularly helpful uh, at identifying uh, which patients with small bowel obstruction are going to go on to uh, have strangulation or ischemia with the attendant morbidity and mortality. And so imaging, particularly CT, is called on uh, to help make that uh, assessment. And in the patient, CT is a re really good test. Uh, in the patient who hasn't had recent surgery, uh, CT for small bowel obstruction is sensitive, it's specific, it's accurate, and it's even more accurate uh, if you use uh, coronal and sagittal uh, multiplanar uh, reformations. I'll say in the patient who's had recent surgery, it's less accurate because a small bowel ileus can mimic a small bowel obstruction in the early postoperative setting. Here's an example of a high-grade small bowel obstruction. The hallmark is small bowel dilatation. Um, here you can see that the proximal small bowel uh, shown by the arrow on the slide right uh, shows dilated small bowel, but the other arrow shows decompressed distal small bowel. And that change uh, in diameter, that uh, transition from dilated to decompressed, is the hallmark of the diagnosis with CT. In addition, you'll see a relatively collapsed colon in patients with a small bowel obstruction. While you can use radiography, and many patients will still get an abdominal x-ray, um, uh, most places work up suspected small bowel with a CT because uh, compared to radiography, we have increased confidence and accuracy in the diagnosis. Importantly, it allows us to identify the specific point of, trend of obstruction, that is the transition between dilated and decompressed bowel. And at that site, you can get an idea of what the etiology of the obstruction is, and it also gives us a clue to the assessment of complications which may require prompt uh, intervention. Here's an example, the same patient with a high-grade small bowel obstruction, note the dilated proximal small bowel, the decompressed distal small bowel, and the point of transition is an incarcerated, uh, in, an inguinal hernia with an incarcerated loop of bowel within it, and this person went promptly to the OR to have that uh, hernia uh, repaired, and here's an example of that hernia on a coronal uh, reformation, and we find those to be very helpful. Here's another example of a patient with a high-grade small bowel obstruction, a big-time proximal uh, a small bowel dilatation, some decompressed distal bowel, and the arrow points to a stricture, and this stricture was due to um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease giving rise to, in this case, a chronic bowel obstruction. And sometimes with high-grade or chronic obstructions, you can get this small bowel feces sign where the, where the small bowel contents look a little bit like fecal material, often suggesting high-grade obstruction, sometimes seen in chronic obstruction as well. So when do I worry when I see patients with a small bowel obstruction? Well, I worry when I think there is strangulation or ischemia. That's more likely to occur in the acute setting or with a high-grade small bowel obstruction. Um, more likely to occur if there is a, um, a hernia that uh, a loop of bowel is incarcerated in, whether that's internal or external. More likely for me to worry when I see a volvulus or I see a closed loop obstruction or any signs of ischemia.
Uh, those are the signs um, that make me worry and I get on the phone and talk to my colleagues in surgery. Said differently, I look for something that a surgeon can fix when I encounter patients with a suspected small bowel obstruction. Now, I think it's worth mentioning that in patients without a known primary tumor, small bowel obstruction is usually due to adhesions and, or, and then less likely hernia uh, or tumors. In patients, however, with a primary tumor, um, the likely, and, and, and look at the uh, uh, coronal image where there's a peritoneal metastasis, the likelihood of a peritoneal metastasis or a serosal based metastasis causing the obstruction um, is much higher, accounting for about 60% of the obstructions with adhesions being less common. Here's an example of a patient with a closed loop obstruction from an adhesion, something a surgeon would be interested in. And there's an, there's an image uh, from Dr. Balthazar's uh, AJR paper in 1994 talking about this closed loop obstruction. I will talk about that in a moment. This is a closed loop obstruction that has not had any uh, volvulus um, uh, associated with it yet. Here's an example of an incarcerated ventral hernia. And here you can see dilated loops of bowel up to this uh, ventral hernia and decompressed bowel exiting the hernia high-grade obstruction caused by this incarcerated ventral hernia, or in this case, the arrow points to a loop of bowel, a knuckle of bowel in the obturator canal, not femoral or inguinal, but rather the obturator canal. That canal can become a little bit lax with age, particularly in older women who've had multiple children. Um, they're at risk for a loop of bowel getting stuck in the obturator canal, giving rise to and obturator hernia. Uh, here is an image from Dr. Federley's uh, textbook that shows that obturator hernia and a nice uh, uh, um, coronal image uh, from a CT scan that shows that knuckle of bowel. There's a nerve that goes through the obturator canal. Maybe it's the obturator nerve, I can't remember, but when that knuckle of bowel is in there and there's a hernia, you can have a characteristic paresthesia in the medial aspect of the thigh which is one clinical finding to look for in patients uh, with that uh, diagnosis. Here's a patient who had uh, gastric bypass and has a transmesenteric internal hernia after gastric bypass. And there's lots of surgical variations in gastric bypass procedures. They are often associated with the creation of a rent in the omentum or the mesentery. And through those rents, loops of bowel uh, can herniate. And here is an example of one. The uh, red arrow shows it really nicely, that loop of bowel going through that rent uh, in the mesentery, uh, giving rise to this uh, internal hernia. And it looks like that loop of bowel has got some ischemia associated with it. A word about closed loop obstructions. A closed loop obstruction implies an obstruction of, the, of, a, of a single, of a loop of bowel at two different points. Um, and this image nicely shows where this adhesion is really picking off the bowel at uh, two locations. So consider this, consider a stocking or a tube sock. If you were to pinch the two ends of the stocking, that's the kind of configuration you get with a closed loop obstruction. And so the bowel contents um, uh, working their way down the GI tract encounter the first obstruction and that causes the proximal obstruction. And then the loop of bowel that's obstructed um, the loop of bowel that's obstructed uh, beyond that uh, continues to secrete fluid within its lumen and it progressively dilates. And, and uh, so in a way, there's two obstructions. There's the obstruction up to the proximal aspect of the closed loop obstruction. Then the loop of bowel itself within the closed loop, that's why it's called closed loop, is also obstructed. Um, so closed loop obstruction implies uh, a bowel obstruction at two points resulting in progressive accumulation of fluid and gas within the isolated segment. It's usually mainly fluid, not so much gas. So there are some findings that help you determine if there's a closed loop obstruction. Sometimes it can be a tricky diagnosis. Generally, the closed loop uh, has um, more dil dilatation than the loops upstream from it. So there's relatively less upstream dilatation. The loops uh, often uh, take on a U or a C shape, or they kind of look clumped together if there's lots of loops. And I'll show you an example of that. Almost as if you can imagine a surgeon can get 
his or her um, sort of hands around the closed the, the uh, loops that are actually involved in the closed loops. If there's been a twist or a volvulus associated with closed loop obstruction, you will see a swirling uh, or whirling in the mesenteric blood vessels and an associated beak sign, just like you would on the leading edge of a, leading edge of a volvulus um, because of that twisting in the mesentery. Sometimes the location of the loops in a closed loop obstruction are more posteriorly than others, but I don't find that particular finding uh, to be helpful. Here is an example of a closed loop obstruction, and there's a really nice example of the twisting or whirling mesenteric blood vessels, the so-called whirling sign, uh, where that uh, closed loop has begun to twist uh, upon itself. Here's a closed loop obstruction with volvulus. You can imagine that you've got this dilated segment that's isolated from the rest of the bowel. It continues to peristalse. And you can imagine that as it continues to peristalse, it may begin to twist upon itself. And so that C-shaped loop of bowel, uh, which is, has thick walls and lots of uh, fluid within it, is now ischemic because it's begun to twist. And there's a volvulus associated with that closed loop as shown nicely on the associated uh, illustration. And of course, when you twist a loop, a loop of bowel, you twist the associated mesenteric blood vessels that supply that loop of bowel. And in particular, you cut off the venous drainage of the bowel, and that can give rise to ischemic changes in that loop of bowel as shown nicely in that uh, image. Here's an example of multiple dilated loops of bowel, and I'm gonna page on through these images. And if you look at the mesenteric blood vessels, and I'll go back up. If you look at the mesenteric blood vessels, you can see that they twist a little bit down to this C-shaped uh, configuration where the uh, wall of the bowel is quite thickened uh, and there's a fluid-filled uh, C-shaped uh, C-shaped uh, loop of bowel. That's the closed loop. And you can see these twisted mesenteric vessels coming up to it. That's an ischemic loop of bowel. This patient's at risk for complications of bowel ischemia and needs to go to surgery sooner rather than later, that loop of bowel might have looked like that uh, grossly. Here's a recent one where there was a closed loop obstruction involving several, in, involving a very long loop of, of bowel. And so lots of these um, uh, dilated loops are um, uh, closely opposed to each other in this image. The red curved arrows point to some twisting of the mesenteric vessels, pretty subtle in this case. But they were present. This person went to the OR and had a closed loop obstruction, had ischemic changes, and those loops of bowel were also uh, hemorrhagic. That brings me to ischemia. So one of the findings that you need to look for when you see patients with small bowel obstruction is ask yourself, is there any evidence of bowel wall ischemia? So what are the CT signs of bowel wall ischemia? So first of all, there's bowel wall thickening. Almost all patients with ischemic bowel have bowel wall thickening. And sometimes that bowel wall thickening will be um, due to hemorrhage within the wall. And so you may see high attenuation of the small bowel in the small bowel wall on a pre-contrast scan. Paradoxically, there's a subset of patients who lose the tone of their bowel and can get very thin loops of bowel. That's a more difficult diagnosis to make, I think. Um, free fluid is almost always present uh, in patients with ischemic bowel. And there's abnormalities of bowel enhancement. Sometimes the abnormality is you'll see target enhancement where the mucosa and the serosa are hyper-enhancing, giving rise to a target configuration. Sometimes you'll see uh, asymmetric enhancement of the bowel. Sometimes you'll see decreased enhancement of the bowel. Patients with uh, bowel ischemia almost always have mesenteric edema, sometimes with engorged blood vessels, often with stranding in the adjacent mesentery due to mesenteric edema. If there's volvulus, look for the swirling or whirling sign of the mesenteric blood vessels, scrolling up and down the coronal plane or the sagittal or the axial plane is helpful there, and look for evidence of ischemia, uh, pneumatosis and portal venous gas, and I'll show some examples of that in a minute. You know, it turns out we're not that good in radiology at uh, diagnosing uh, bowel wall ischemia. Um, and to complicate that, the literature is a mess. All the studies have been retrospective. The patient groups are very selected. There's often little path proof in these patients. The patients without bowel ischemia never get path proof. Ischemia may resolve, and so there may be ischemia present, but there's no path proof. There's um, 
loose use of the of the word infarction versus ischemia in the surgical and the pathologic and the radiological literature. And surgical findings are inaccurate. Uh, sometimes the ischemia may be limited to the mucosa only, and a surgeon will often see the bowel from the perspective of the serosa. And so the serosa may look normal, but the, there, there may be ischemic changes in the mucosa. So the assessment in the OR may be uh, inaccurate. Let me show you some examples of of complications of small bowel obstruction with uh, bowel ischemia. Here's wall thickening. You will almost always have wall thickening in patients with bowel ischemia. Note there's also free intraperitoneal fluid. There's increased attenuation in the adjacent mesenteric fat. All of those findings are worrisome for bowel wall uh, ischemia. Um, often uh, the ischemic segments uh, will have uh, hemorrhage within the bowel wall. And so you'll see a high attenuation in the bowel wall has been described uh, by Jeff Roy and others uh, as indicated uh, in this uh, reference. I don't think we see this finding very often, but here's a case where we did high attenuation in the small bowel. Um, this patient went to the OR. There was a closed loop obstruction, and sure enough, that high attenuation corresponded to hemorrhagic and ischemic changes in those loops of bowel. Other findings to suggest ischemia here are the is the mesentery in the edema and the little bit of free uh, intraperitoneal fluid. Here's an, here's an example of a patient with proven uh, transmural infarction of the bowel, and they had paper-thin uh, paper bowel, super thin, paradoxically. And I think this is due to loss of the tone of the bowel wall, and you get this thinning. I don't think we see this very often. I think it's a tough finding to make with confidence but it's been described and associated with uh, bowel ischemia. Here's another example of a closed loop obstruction. See the C-shaped loop down in the pelvis, but note that the adjacent uh, mesentery uh, has um, edematous changes within it, and note that there's a little bit of free intraperitoneal fluid, all findings that raise the possibility of uh, ischemic bowel. Another example of a closed loop. See how those loops of bowel are almost clumped together? You can imagine a surgeon can almost get his or her hand sort of around them uh, when they identify them in an exploratory laparotomy. Here it's very difficult to figure out sort of where the bowel wall ends and the mesenteric edema starts, but there's lots of edema in that mesentery, some free intraperitoneal fluid as well, all concerning for uh, bowel wall ischemia. You can see variations uh, uh, on the uh, abnormal enhancement patterns in the setting of ischemia. Here's an example of where the mucosa uh, was um, hyperenhancing. The serosa on the outside was hyperenhancing. And you can see the edematous, low attenuation, low attenuation muscularis mucosa uh, in between. This target appearance can be associated with ischemia. It can be associated with inflammatory and infectious enteritis as well, but clearly can be seen with ischemic enteritis. Here's another example of a closed loop obstruction. Look at the diseased loop of bowel down in the pelvis. The magnified view shows again this target appearance of the bowel wall due to the enhancing mucosa, the enhancing serosa, and this low attenuation uh, submucosal, submucosal uh, layer, or muscularis propria layer, pardon me, um, gives rise to this target appearance uh, characteristic and associated with ischemia. Again, an enteritis uh, due to uh, ischemia or an inflammatory uh, or infectious etiology could also have the same uh, appearance. Now, lack of enhancement uh, can be subtle, uh, but you have to look for it. Check out the loops of bowel in the left abdomen on this patient with a bowel obstruction after an abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. Um, those, those loops of bowel have normal bowel wall enhancement, but the loops on the right side have no enhancement. There's also some free fluid on the right side. And those loops that have no enhancement were proven to be uh, ischemic. Those loops of bowel might have looked like this uh, at uh, surgery. Or in this case, again, the loops uh, in the left side of the abdomen, there's some peristaltic artifact there, but the loops on the left side look like they're enhancing pretty normally. Uh, on the right side, uh, they're not enhancing at all. And those loops on the right side were proven to be uh, hemorrhagic. Caution, though, uh, if you're if you're looking at the early arterial phase images, sometimes it takes a it takes a seconds uh, for the bowel to enhance, and 
Some um, of the proximal bowel may enhance more, more quickly than the more distal bowel. And so a pitfall of decreased enhancement in the distal bowel may simply be due artifactual, artifactual due to scanning the patient very quickly. Another example of decreased enhancement in the loops of bowel in the lower abdomen compared to the upper abdomen, check the coronal view there. That difference of enhancement along with the bowel wall thickening and free fluid uh, raises the possibility of ischemia. I already showed this one, but I'll show it again. Uh, the pre-contrast views, this is the patient who had hemorrhagic necrosis with the high attenuation in the loops of bowel, but the two images on the right were after contrast was given, and, and you'll note the loops of bowel in the left abdomen or enhancing the loops of the bowel in this closed loop on the right are not at all, and this patient had proven ischemia as well. Dual energy CT ought to help us uh, with ischemic changes um, because the difference between the ischemic and the perfused segments of bowel will be more conspicuous on a low uh, KEV image or an iodine-only image compared to a standard uh, 120 KEV, KV tech, KVP technique. And so I think dual energy CT can be useful to increase the conspicuity of ischemic segments and probably increase our accuracy uh, in identifying these patients. Here's an example of a case I borrowed from Dr. Lubner, my colleague at the University of Wisconsin, and it shows clear bowel ischemia, there's portal venous gas, there's, uh, there's pneumatosis, but you'll note on the iodine material density image that the more anterior small bowel has iodine signal within it, whereas the loops of bowel in the left, uh, in the left uh, pericolic gutter have no iodine signal intensity at all within them, and that difference there uh, points to the presence of ischemia, clearly seen to better advantage on the iodine material, iodine material density images on the 51 KEV uh, images. Here's an example from Duke, from Chad Miller, my partner. And again, the left colon in this particular case uh, has, uh, excuse me, the right colon uh, has uh, uh, decreased enhancement, and that decreased enhancement I think is seen uh, most conspicuous on the iodine overlay images shown on the bottom where the oranges signal uh, corresponds to iodine. In the left colon you see that the orange iodine signal, whereas the lack of that signal in the right colon um, points to uh, decreased uh, perfusion of the uh, bowel in that particular case, that was colon. Now, here's a patient who had abdominal pain postoperatively and had some pneumatosis in some loops of bowel that you can see on the lung windows, probably to best advantage. Every time you start thinking about bowel ischemia or you put the word bowel ischemia in your report, take a moment and make sure that you've looked at the takeoff of the celiac axis, the superior mesenteric artery, and the IMA and the associated mesenteric veins as well because the red circle encircles the superior mesenteric artery and note the filling defect in the SMA. And I'll tell you that body imagers miss filling defects in the SMA not infrequently. You have to look at the SMA um, and follow it on down into the mesentery to find blood clots in the SMA and the celiac axis. And so one of my rules of thumb, if we're talking about ischemic changes in a report, I make certain that I go back through and look at the takeoff of the celiac, the SMA, the IMA, and the uh, mesenteric veins uh, as well. And here's a case of jejunal ischemia due to SMA thrombosis. When you begin to see a pneumatosis, as in this particular case, the diagnosis is fairly straightforward. CT is a nice problem solver for uh, suspected uh, pneumatosis. If you're not certain if you're dealing with pneumatosis, if you happen to see gas in the mesenteric veins, so look at the mesenteric veins here that are draining that diseased loop of bowel. They have gas within them. If you have any question about the presence of pneumatosis, but if you see gas in mesenteric veins, you don't have a question anymore. Because if you see gas in those mesenteric veins, then clearly um, there's going to be pneumatosis uh, in that uh, bowel wall. So that's a nice helpful finding. And here's the, the, the world's worst case of pneumatosis with portal venous gas uh, that I have ever seen. Now, I was really heartened by this article, and I'm just about finished here, um, which was from my colleagues up at the University of Wisconsin. And they basically looked at uh, clinical uh, CT features and clinical features and laboratory features and asked the question, how good are these various things? 
in predicting patients who are going to need surgical intervention for suspected uh, small bowel obstruction. And they looked at a whole bunch of uh, CT variables, the classic things. Was there a transition point? Uh, was the colon decompressed? Was there, small, was there a small bowel stool? Was there small bowel wall thickening? And, and on and on and on. And they also had a subjective score of uh, patients likely needing surgery or patients likely having bowel ischemia or patients likely needing a bowel resection. And they put those subjective scores on a one through five scale. And they looked at clinical data and laboratory data as well. So it was retrospective review of 179 patients by three radiologists. They looked at these features. They put all these features into a multivariate analysis uh, and ran the analysis. And what they found was that findings that were predictive of a patient needing surgery were the ones that you would have probably guessed in the first place. More likely in patients with a high-grade small bowel obstruction, if the radiologist's impression was that their impression was that this patient needed to go to surgery, that was associated with the need to go to surgery. To identify a transition point was associated with the need to go to surgery. To identify a closed loop or mesenteric congestion, all those findings were associated with the need to go to surgery. And it was heartening to me that basically the radiologist's impression on these reports was better than any clinical or individual clinical or laboratory parameter. So no question that CT is a valuable tool in sorting out patients with small bowel obstruction who will need surgery versus those who will not need surgery. So in conclusion, when I see these cases, you know, first of all, look for the point of obstruction. At that point, you can begin to identify the uh, etiology. Look carefully for a twist or a swirling sign. Uh, in the mesenteric blood vessels, which suggest a volvulus. Um, look for something a surgeon can fix, like an internal or external hernia, and ask yourself, are you dealing with a closed loop obstruction? I do think that's a difficult diagnosis to make, and you have to think about it. Once, you, once you've, once you've um, identified a small bowel obstruction, look carefully for any evidence of ischemia, and I think it's reasonable to overcall here a little bit. You don't want to undercall ischemia. I think it's okay to overcall a little bit. I think it's important to, when you see these cases to get on the phone and have a conversation with the surgeon. And I think dual energy CT uh, may prove helpful uh, in the assessment of these difficult patients. Thank you very much for your attention.